Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Zanaida Gould, and I'm the executive director of the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute. Tonight, we're having a conversation about the 40th anniversary of the landmark court case, Plyler v. Doe. With us tonight, we are going to be joined by two legal experts who will guide us through the history and impact of Plyler v. Doe. With us right now, we have Selena Moreno, CEO and President of the Intercultural Development Research Association, or IDRA, which is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to equity and excellence in education. She's also former Director of Policy and Litigation for the Southwest Regional Office of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, or MALDEF, the nation's leading Latino legal civil rights organization where she handled multiple cases involving educational access, school funding, and immigrant rights. Selena has been a guest with us before, so welcome back, Selena. Thank you, Sarah, so much. And thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, and to the MACRI Board of Directors, we at IDRA are so proud to support MACRI's founding um, to fill such an important void uh, and really as a crucial continuation of civil rights focused organizations um, that are national in scope, but that were founded uh, here in San Antonio, like RDRA, MALDEF, Southwest Voter Registration, uh, and others. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Selena Moreno and I'm the president and CEO of IDRA. Um, I've had the honor of serving in this position since 2019, and I'm really excited to talk to you uh, about one of the most important cases for our organization. For those of you who might not know who we are, um, I'll just give some quick background on IDRA. Uh, we are a national organization, and while we work uh, in schools from New York City to Los Angeles, we really focus mostly on the US South, and our team is based in Texas and Georgia. Um, throughout our history, we've, we've been vocal advocates um, for, the, for the right of every student to an equal educational opportunity. Um, and we, we look at education through multiple lens, teacher training, policy advocacy, student and parent leadership uh, development, and actionable research. Um, but before I, I get started, I really want to want to begin with a shout out. Um, I, I find it really hard to talk about education justice for undocumented immigrants or Latino students. Um, without thinking of the late Michael Olivas, who was my former law school professor and one of my mentors um, when he served on the MALDEF board um, at the same time that um, I, I served directing the, the Southwest office. Um, he, uh, as some of you might know, passed away in April of this year. Um, so many of us stand on his shoulders. Uh, he served as a longtime professor of law um, at the University of Houston and former president of the University of Houston downtown. Um, he's a giant in the Latino community um, because of his legal scholarship related to DACA, to in-state tuition laws. He's known to be one of the drafters of the Texas Dream Act and the Texas Top 10% law. And so um, I would be remiss if, if I didn't just give him a, a shout out. He, he's also uh, was a friend who was just so selfless in his pursuit um, uh, to help other lawyers um, rise to, to give back to our community. And, and probably those of you who might know him, know him for his exceptional wit um, when explaining why he switched from um, the priesthood, uh, from preparing for the priesthood to uh, becoming a lawyer. He would always joke, um, I was much better at afflicting the comfortable than I ever was at comforting the afflicted. Um, but I would argue that ultimately he did both. So today, uh, I'm talking to you about Plyler v. Doe in, in large part because uh, of Professor Olivas and people um, like him. Um, we will go through some of the highlights of the context at the time that the case was filed, um, the crux of what the Supreme Court decision said, um, and what it still means in today's world. You'll hear from me, but you'll also hear, and I'm really excited about this, uh, from um, an interview with IDRA's former policy director, um, Dr. Albert Cortez. He, like our founder, Dr. Jose Cárdenas, um, was a witness in the case. Um, and, and you'll hear also um, 
from IDRA's Chief Legal Analyst, our inaugural Chief Legal Analyst, Paige Duggins-Clay, who is um, joining me today, and she's going to talk about her interview, too, with, with Dr. Cortez, as well as a, a case that she's helping um, lead for, for IDRA right now um, in our amicus briefing on, on a case that is seeking to protect and defend the Texas Dream Act. Um, so I, I'm excited to introduce you to Pace. To, to Paige, and if Paige, you're on, um, say hello. Hello. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about this really important civil rights issue. Thank you, Paige. And for a more detailed walkthrough of Plyler, and especially IDRA's involvement in the case, um, you can hear Paige's full interview uh, with Dr. Cortez, and this really cool behind-the-scenes take uh, on what happened in Plyler um, in a new IDRA series of podcasts episodes called Education and the Law. Um, and that's where we highlight some of our nation's landmark civil rights cases in, in education. Um, the first one was about Brown v. Board, um, got to start there. And the second was about Plyler. Um, but you'll also hear, uh, you'll, you'll also likely hear uh, additional episodes about the um, tumultuous Supreme Court term that just ended, um, and, and a little bit more about IDRA's legacy uh, from a legal perspective, from giving, um, you know, expert witness testimony to some of the behind the link scenes legal strategy, um, amicus brief advocacy, et cetera. And really our goal with this series is to take complex legal con concepts and really make them accessible to um, the people that are most impacted by these cases. Um, so be sure to just subscribe to the IDRA Class Notes podcast. Uh, we'll be sure to to add a link to, um, uh, to to do so. But today we're here to talk about Plyler v. Doe, which was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court on June 15, 1982, 40 years ago um, this year. In 1977, Malda filed a federal lawsuit challenging a Texas law that sought to exclude undocumented children from K through 12 schools by charging tuition. And in 1982, the US Supreme Court ruled that that law was unconstitutional and in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of our Constitution. Because of the decision that was reached in Plyler, every child is guaranteed access to a free public K through 12 school uh, education regardless of their immigrant immigration status. Um, and this was truly, uh, I don't think it can be overstated, it was truly a, a watershed moment um, for immigrants' rights in the United States. Not just immigration, uh, immigrant student justice, but immigrants' rights more broadly. Um, before that moment uh, is really a moment that we never wanna return to. Um, you know, when, a moment when immigrants were fighting to establish their most basic humanity um, as persons under the US Constitution. Um, as we'll talk about, that basic assertion of humanity, that was really the first step before winning in, in court to establish equal access to a free K through 12 public education. The Supreme Court in that case said, denying, that, denying immigrant students enrollment in public schools creates a class of marginalized youth with limited opportunities for education and for social advancement. So why, um, you know, why is, is Plyler so important um, to all of us? Why does this matter for quality school programs? Uh, we believe that all students deserve access to high quality public schools, um, programs that support early literacy, um, academic success, you know, that really is gonna prepare them for the rest of their lives and careers. Um, and so the Plyler case supports schools by number one, protecting basic access for all students to enroll in school, um, promoting trust and safety among families, among students, among school communities, and ensuring that all eligible, eligible children get the educational services um, that they deserve. The Supreme Court recognized that denying th this benefit to, to uh, these children really creates an underclass of Americans. Um, you know, we would see illiteracy rates increase. We would see opportunities for workforce and community participation 
um, diminish. Um, and in fact, we've seen research that shows that for every dollar that is invested in the education of children, at least $9 is returned um, to, to the community. I, I'd like now to just dive a little deeper into the facts of the case itself um, by, by talking about some of the legislative history that, that's uh, really fascinating. You know, the story of Plyler uh, began several years before the Supreme Court issued its opinion on the case. So the actual uh, story begins at the end of the Texas um, 1975 legislative session. For those of you who have worked in a Texas legislative session, you know that late spring um, is a crazy time in the legislative session. That's when bills, people are trying to get bills through. It's kind of the hustle and bustle, um, you know, bills moving through the different chambers, uh, people trying to, to slip in last minute amendments and get real sneaky. And that's exactly what happened um, in the Plyler v. Doe case. Um, the, the law that was at issue in Plyler v. Doe, it was one of those last minute backdoor additions to an existing piece of education legislation. There was no opportunity to present testimony. Um, there was no opportunity for debate. Um, and the, that backdoor amendment did two things. Uh, number one, it authorized local school districts in Texas to deny enrollment in their public schools to children that were not legally admitted to the country. And number two, it permitted the state to withhold, actually withhold state funds for the education of undocumented children. As a result of that amendment, thousands of undocumented immigrant children that had been attending public schools um, up to that, that time um, were subsequently denied admission. Um, so just imagine that, you know, you're, your, your child is in school and all of a sudden they're denied um, admission to, to Texas public schools. Um, and some schools began actually charging um, these, these families uh, to attend what used to be free public schools um, and, and really effectively denying them access. So at that point, for example, um, you know, tuition might have been $2,000 per student, which was at, at that time completely um, at let's be real at this time too, but at that time, uh, completely out of reach for 99% of, of the families, um, you know, that, that were impacted. Uh, and I think one thing that, that Paige and I have talked about that's really interesting, uh, you know, our, our late founder of IDRA, Dr. Jose Cardenas, has pointed out, uh, you know, in, in many of his writings about the case, this change in law was not only painful because it was had this discriminatory intent among um, immigrant families, but also uh, because it was really uh, taking advantage, exploiting a weakness in the, the education system. Um, you know, the, the insufficiency uh, of school funding uh, in Texas public education that had been going on for decades, um, you know, that I know uh, IDRA certainly, MALDEF certainly, and many, many of us, um, you know, care deeply of, of, about and, and are still fighting to um, remedy. I want to just take a pause, Paige, and, and uh, you know, you, you had a really fascinating conversation with, with Dr. Albert Cortez um, from, from IDRA about um, his, his time um, with, and his experience with, with Plyler DeVito. Uh, he he talks a little bit with you about you know who who are the people that are impacted um, you know in, in the case who who are the fa these families um, and and many of you I think in the Macri community of course know um, you know who, who Peter Roos is um, the the attorney that uh, one of the attorneys that argued the case and and he talks you know in, in oral argument about who the the Doe family. Is right. They've been here since since 1964. They own property in Tyler, Texas. They pay taxes on that property, um, and their children have been at attending schools for five or six years before um, they were actually excluded, you know, from from the from their their schools. But Paige, uh, if you can just set up, uh, and we're going to show a clip of, of that conversation that you had. If you could just set that up for us. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Selena. Um, you know, I really can't encourage the community enough to check out the podcast recording with Dr. Cortez. He's a treasure um, and his perspective and insight and sort of the workings, not only of the case, but of sort of the policy implications and the real people who are involved is just really worth listening to the full conversation. And one of the things that I really um, had a deeper understanding that, you know, I think those of us in the civil rights community sort of innately assume um, and understand, but that wasn't, you know, clear is the real danger that these families faced when they chose to, you know, be brave and to, you know, pursue this litigation against the state of Texas and against their school district. You'll note that the case is styled Plyler v. Doe, Plyler, of course, being the superintendent and the, and the school official and Doe being the children um, and their families. Um, that wasn't how it originally started. And I think it's worth highlighting that there was a case filed in Houston before the Plyler case where the parents <clears throat> and the and the children were named. And sub sub subsequently after that, were actually threatened with um, Im immigration action and deportation and harassed in the community. And so sort of because of that, um, the lessons learned from that case, the litigants made a really intentional decision to no longer name uh, the, the children and their families in the case. And so notwithstanding that fact, you know, uh, you'll hear in just a moment, Dr. Cortez talk about sort of the community in Tyler and sort of the political and the cultural dynamics that were at play in the state in that in that case. Um, it was clear, you know, in many ways what what children were um, bringing the suit and they really faced tremendous adversity in their in their families and bringing this case to get the right outcome, not only for their school and for the state of Texas, but as you'll hear Dr. Cortez talk about later in our talk today for the entire nation. So I just can't speak enough about their bravery and I'll let uh, Dr. Cortez tell you in his own words about um, what the community in Tyler, Texas was like at the time this lawsuit was filed. Okay, we're going to the clip. So you mentioned we're in Tyler, Texas. You know, our listeners are not just from Texas, they're all across the country. Can you, can you give our outsiders um, a perspective? What's Tyler, Texas like, and what was it like litigating an immigration civil rights case in, in this community? Well, well, well Tyler was, was, was selected in part because it was uh, somewhat typical of many of the small, uh, smaller school districts around the state. Enrolled, uh, I'd say at the time, probably around 10,000 students total. It had a handful of undocumented immigrant children enrolled. So there weren't really significant cost savings uh, that would have been realized to, to the district, but there were sub elements within the community and within the school system that felt that undocumented immigrant children didn't deserve to be educated in Texas public schools. Uh, using essentially a, an erroneous assumption that they were here uh, and that the education of their children was being exclusively subsidized by uh, legal Texas residents when, when the truth was that these families pay taxes like every other family. They pay property taxes either through rents or, or, or payment on their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, also paid sales taxes, they paid uh, gasoline taxes, uh, and like any other person living in the state of Texas, there was no escaping their contributing to the state uh, economy. So there really was uh, a, a, an issue, a, a, a real uh, concern that people saw that somewhere or other these undocumented immigrant children were uh, being uh, subsidized when in, in reality, the parents were just seeking the benefit of education just as education was being provided to every other tax paying uh, individual in, in the state of Texas. Yeah, Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, and I think, thank you, Sarah, for showing that. And, you know, one other dynamic that, again, I can't encourage you enough to listen to Dr. Cortez talking about this case, but the other interesting component of this case um, and story, important so part of the story is the uh, the cast of characters and the legends that were involved, including 
um, a federal district judge named William Wayne Justice. What what a great name for um, a lawyer and a, and a judge who's you know really famed for his incredible work um, protecting the civil rights of children and particularly in the space of education. So Dr. Cortez talks about his role in this case and many others in the podcast. But I just think we'll we'll revisit this when we talk about sort of Plyler's legacy and threats threat suppliers legacy at the end of this conversation, but can't, um, you know, talk about this case without talking about Judge Justice, who is famous for not only the Plyler case, but also for um, in putting the entire state of Texas under federal court order to desegregate, um, implementing the ruling of Brown versus Board of Education. That kind of order was just simply not <laughs> done in a state like Texas. And so bravery is a theme. I think you'll hear a lot where the, it was the families the lawyers, both Maldef and other private lawyers, who in some cases, you know, had to keep a low profile in these communities that were, you know, had distinct anti-immigrant, anti-Latino um, flares. And so I think that's an incredible aspect that, you know, 40 years later, we continue to sort of tap into that, you know, spirit and that resiliency as we continue to fight these battles today. Yeah, thank you so much, Paige, for, for adding that in. And speaking of, of some of the cast of, of characters, um, you know, many, many of you know, uh, because she's part of the, the Macri community, um, Norma Cantu, who is a, a the, the former um, assistant secretary of education um, under President Clinton. She actually, when she was uh, what, what we call a baby lawyer at, at Maldif at the time, um, was probably the only person um, to actually be in the courtroom in both Tyler uh, Texas and in, in Houston, Texas, you know, before the cases were were consolidated, you know, she would drive from the one trial and then, uh, you know, drive several hours away to the to the next trial. Um, and, and she likes to joke that that it's, you know, she's the Latina Forrest Gump, you know, one of those right, right place, right time kind of things. But those who know her know better um, and know her brilliance. And of course, now um, she is is the chair uh, of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Um, but, you know, what is it that the, the lawyers were arguing? Um, let's start with, with the state of Texas. Um, you know, the opening argument for that the state made is actually that they told the U.S. Supreme Court um, the children of undocumented families are not legal persons under the U.S. Constitution. Um, how horrible to try to defend that position. Um, you know, they also said, and, and you'll, this will sound familiar, uh, that the federal government was doing nothing to control the drain of the state's educational resources um, and those of its school districts, um, and that the state had an interest in reducing illegal immigration. Uh, you know, they, the state argued that, that denying the uh, students free public education would actually serve as a deterrent to illegal immigration. Um, and, and those are those are things that we hear still today, right? Um, Texas argued that immigrants were coming to the United States to take advantage of education. Um, but it came out in oral argument that that's just not accurate, right? Actually, 90% of, of undocumented immigrants at the time were not even bringing their families um, with them when, when they crossed the border. So what was the, the, the plaintiff's response? Um, Maldif and other attorneys argued that, number one, the children are in fact persons, human beings, um, and and also that they're not going anywhere. They, they, these are our uh, friends, neighbors, family members, part of our community, um, and and they really said education, if at all, is a minimal pull factor um, in terms of immigration, uh, and that the preclusion uh, of education of undocumented students is not an effective deterrent. It's not going to to address the issue of of a multiple immigration, um, and you know by the way, uh, Texas trying to address that interest does not out, outweigh the the fundamental harm uh, being done uh, to these children by denying them public education. The lower court sided with the plaintiffs. Um, the Texas Education Agency fought tooth and nail um, in this case, uh, taking it. Um, to the Fifth Circuit appealing, and then when they lost there, appealing again to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, so some pretty ugly stuff. Uh, what happened when they got to the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, first, the Supreme Court said, 
um, you know, that thing called Equal Protection Clause, you know, which says, nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdi jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Um, so yes, uh, the Supreme Court said undocumented persons are in fact persons. Um, in an issue as vital as basic education, the court said, um, you know, which essentially uh, will have lifelong impact on the well-being of the people who, who are being impacted. Um, we as the court can't simply look um, at whether there's some type of rational explanation for taking such a drastic option, um, a, a option away from from these these youth, um, and they continually call them innocent youth. Um, that it requires a higher bar, right? We're we're talking about um, public education. They didn't go as far as to say that education was a fundamental right. We know that from the Rodriguez case um, in the the previous decade. Um, but they said there has to be such compelling damage done to the school district or to the state of Texas um, that the lifelong harm that's being imposed on these children would be offset. And that's just not the case here. The court also noted that the impact um, was not only to the children, but also, uh, you know, in terms of their education, but also their inability, um, you know, to later be able to find employment, to access health care, um, you know, even even um, accessing um, the justice system in a fair manner. Um, and, and those are things that if they were denied complete education, um, they would suffer. Um, the court went on to say that this Texas law, um, you know, which really directed the onus of a parent's conduct, um, you know, it, and, and using that against their kids um, doesn't comport with fundamental concepts of what justice is. Um, so, you know, that, that was a huge part of the court's decision. And again, just the pivotal role that education plays in our society, in our democracy, um, you know, sustaining our political and cultural heritage, um, you know, for, for better or worse, right? That, that it's just a key part of, of who we are um, uh, as, as a nation. Um, and it said, you know, that, that education is not just some other benefit. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it is something to be distinguished from other types of social welfare laws um, and that they have, have recommended, uh, really recognized it as a key part of our, our system of government. I, I want to go back to, Dr., to you, Paige, and to Dr. Cortez about what it was like to actually feel, um, you know, that decision and, and, and be there when it happened. Absolutely. You know, and I think another important piece of context is, you know, this this case, this opinion, Pilot Vidal was the culmination of several individual lawsuits, right, filed all over the state and Dallas and Houston and Tyler, Texas. Uh, the one in Tyler, of course, becoming the lead case. And one of the amazing things that happened, I already mentioned that in the first case, the Houston case, you know, the plaintiffs lost. But um, what happened in Tyler was there was a statewide a, a, a statewide injunction filed. And so that was really important because the litigation took several years to play out. And it was really wonderful because that meant that the state could not discriminate against undocumented students while the litigation was um, was playing out, which is not a standard that, you know, I think for many decades, that was sort of the assumption of, of how the federal courts would operate. And I think today what we're seeing is less of a inclination to grant that kind of injunctive re relief against discriminatory state action. So I just wanted to highlight that and uh, provide that context because that was the backdrop for um, Dr. Cortez's reaction to the case. And we can show that now, Sarah. Okay, there we go. Remember when the decision finally came down that 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 day when it was announced and the ruling was announced what a tremendous what a tremendous uh, victory that was but more importantly what a tremendous relief it was for that fundamental issue about access of children having access to public schools was and 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 I smiled as I thought back that it let it be Texas it, it wasn't ironic to me that it was a Texas based ruling that the rest of the country I know California was watching I suspect Florida was watching 
as well as New York and all the states around the country were, were sitting back and taking note. And I felt the great relief. Yeah, I, I, I've watched that clip a million times and every time I just get goosebumps, Sarah and Selena, just to, to, to think about that moment. And I love going back to that moment and to Dr. Cortez's, you know, experience in that case too, because, you know, there's, it's tough in the, in this current climate um, when we're litigating civil rights cases, whether we're litigating them or we're working on, you know, state or federal civil rights policy, particularly in the education context, we've just seen over the last several years, um, really, really challenging environment to sort of affirm the values um, that, you know, for many, many years have been sort of foundational principles. And so uh, when I'm feeling discouraged or overwhelmed, I always think about Dr. Cortez's words and, and just um, feel re-energized knowing that there's sort of the continual path forward. That's that's absolutely right. Like we'll, on hard days, we know we know they didn't give up. We can't we can't give up. And I think that's true for for, for all of us. And this win was so um, hard fought. Uh, and we know that these wins that are, are hard fought, um, it's not just in that moment, right, in that celebration in that relief, but also what happens next. And so even um, even going forward, right, Plyler v. Doe requires vigilance from all of us. Um, I know uh, as a former Maldiv attorney, at the beginning of every school year, we would get calls from, from parents whose children um, had been denied admission um, in violation of Plyler v. Doe. Um, and so that's why for, for decades, IDRA has partnered with Maldiv and many, many other of our coalition partners uh, to send out a school opening alert to families, to advocates and to school districts directly um, to help inform them, uh, here, are, uh, here are our students' rights, here's what the law says, here's what your obligation is. Um, and, and specifically that public schools, you cannot deny admission to a student um, you know, during either initial enrollment or at any other time on the basis of their undocumented status. Um, you can't treat a student differently differently to determine their residency. You can't engage in any practices um, that would chill the right uh, of access to school. You can't require uh, students or parents to disclose um, or document their immigration status. Um, you cannot require um, you know, social security numbers, right? Uh, that's something that would expose uh, somebody's undocumented status. Um, and that if you do ask for for um, those numbers, you have to also be willing to assign another number um, to to a student so so as not to I exclude them. Um, you, you can't make inquiries, in other words, um, that really seek to get around Plyler. And, and those, those steps are and, and obligations to schools are really important and not everybody to this day, right? There might be an attendance clerk or might, there might be a counselor that still does not uh, know. So it's important every year to reaffirm Plyler um, because there are current attacks, right? Um, and, and we'll share the, our school opening alert um, and, and resources that we, that we send out each year. Um, but yeah, we, we know there are, are current attacks. Um, you know, the, even though the Texas law says all students uh, uh, of a particular age, six to 19, they have to attend school. Um, you know, that's there's a compulsory attendance law in Texas. Um, and even though Congress later actually codified Plyler, uh, that does not stop people from attacking it. And in fact, as we many of us know that the Texas governor, um, Greg Abbott, recently um, make direct attacks on the validity of Plyler, said he wanted to challenge it in a radio interview, um, you know, said that states have to come out of pocket to pay for the federal government's failures. Um, and so uh, those statements are a continued attack um, on on our most vulnerable children and communities. And, and even if they're reckless or even if they're empty threats, right, we, we know that we can't take anything for granted. Um, you know, we know comments like these have immediate chilling effects um, on families um, and making, they, they really do make implementation of, of decisions like Plyler even trickier. Um, and I think that's why you're seeing superintendents, right, all over the state speak out in support 
of immigrant students. Um, you know, it, it's things are different uh, than they were before. Whereas, whereas even border um, districts were on the side of the state as coast conspirators. Um, you know, you're you're seeing now that un unlike that time in Plyler, many school districts um, are are whether they're low wealth, high wealth school districts, urban, rural, um, big or small, they came out um, you know supporting immigrant students in the face of of these um, attacks by by the governor recently, um, and and several of them actually put statements out condemning um, the governor's comments. Um, and so that that's something that um, I think is is different now. Um, but there are also a lot of things that are different uh, in in a bad way, right? Um, we we know that Plyler's well settled law, but that hasn't um, stopped uh, the the Supreme Court, um, you know, from from taking drastic action uh, on other types of well settled law. Uh, in in Plyler, a case that seems many so obvious to us, right? Uh, many people are surprised that that um, it took uh, a five-four decision, right? That four justices actually disagreed with the premise of, of Plyler, um, including, for example, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who was seen seen often, right, by many people uh, uh, during her time as a swing vote, um, and, and really by the end of her tenure, frustrated with the direction the court was taking, and of course. Um, since that time in, in 2006, since she retired, things look very, very diff different for the court um, with Justices Alito, um, with Justices uh, Kavanaugh, uh, you know, Coney Barrett, um, you know, Roberts, um, and uh, Gorsuch being additions to the court. And so we really can't take anything uh, for granted. I think that it's important for us, given those comments, right, to really double down and stand up and, and uh, make sure, I mean, we're seeing, this is not unique to immigrant students, it's really the most vulnerable children, right? We're seeing the governor uh, attacking the, the most vulnerable children, right? Trans children and their families who are seeking um, gender affirming care, um, you know, students who, who um, are, are undocumented. Um, and so I think we have to continue to be vigilant. Um, Plyler is also uh, a foundation, right? So these, these Plyler students, all these years later, um, you know, became, became other, uh, they, they became dreamer students, they became DACA recipients, right? It's really a key legal authority that we have to protect. Um, and, and I wanted to just turn it to you, Paige, uh, you know, before you joined IDRA as our inaugural chief legal analyst, um, you were representing um, the University of North Texas, um, you and, and, and your law firm um, at, at the time, in, in a case to, to really uh, try to defend um, the university's right to charge out-of-state tuition, but also um, in a case that, that threatened uh, the, the Texas Dream Act. And, and this is a case um, for, for our audience called Young Conservatives of Texas, YCT. Um, they're represented in this case by the Texas Public Policy Foundation um, versus the University of North Texas. And um, for those of you have, who have attended Texas public universities in the last few decades, um, you know, you might have heard of YCT, the Young Conservatives of Texas. Um, think the affirmative action bake sales that they have on campus, the catch an illegal immigrant game, um, really cruel games that they play on, uh, on campus. Uh, I know when I was at, at the University of Texas in the late 90s um, for Texas Independence Day, uh, they actually got a, a Mexican um, vaquero uh, in, as a piñata and, and, and just beat the crap out of it. Um, so this, these are, these are, uh, this is definitely a group, um, a fringe group that is trying to accomplish, right, what they could, what they haven't been able to do in the legislature, uh, and using the courts to attack the Dream Act. And, and Paige, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about that case and and the work that that you and Idea Ray uh, and all of our our, our allies are are um, fighting for in this case. 
Absolutely. And I think it's important to talk about this case, not only because of, you know, it is part of Tyler's legacy, but also because of this the, the story. Um, and again, so much of the work of civil rights litigation and advocacy is around storytelling, right? Um, and so I, you can't really um, make up these kinds of backgrounds. The case was filed um, against UNT. Um, and, you know, and many people ask, well, why was UNT chosen, you know, of all the schools? Why not UT Austin? Why not some of the bigger, you know, schools? UNT was specifically chosen, you know, I think one reason is because of the venue, right? They really wanted to get um, a, what they perceived to be a um, favorable judge to, to hear this case and to rule in favor of their, um, as Selena suggested, fringe opinion. And, you know, they did. So this case is filed in the Eastern District of, District of Texas and Federal District Court. And um, just the irony of the fact that this is the actual bench that Justice William Wayne Justice sat in issuing Plyler. Um, you know, 40 years later, we have a new federal district judge appointed by Donald Trump, um, who is now ruling in a case to really undermine Plyler's legacy. And so I just think that that's an important framing and um, a really important part of the story that just adds even more weight to the responsibility we have to defend Pilot's legacy. What's the case about? Well, as Selena suggested, it's really, um, and, and sort of like Plyler itself, there's so many interesting parallels. This is yet another backdoor attempt to undermine and get at the rights of undocumented students. Um, and so in this case, YCT has alleged that the university is violating the constitution by collecting out-of-state tuition against its citizen members. Why is that, you might wonder. Um, why, do, why does YCT have the right to get um, in-state tuition? Well, they don't, but they are arguing to the court that because under Texas law, the Texas Dream Act, um, because universities are allowed to offer in-state tuition to certain undocumented students who go to high school in Texas and reside here for three years, that um, that conflicts with the federal immigration law um, that puts some limitations on universities' ability to provide those sorts of opportunities for undocumented students. Um, it's a really unique case, and the remedy that they've sought is really, really extreme. I can't underscore this enough, um, and it's quite clever, right? Instead of asking the court, like the plaintiffs in so many other cases in California and Texas, which Maldiv has litigated in other states, they are not asking the court to take away uh, in-state tuition eligibility from DREAMers. And instead, they're asking the court to apply it to them as well. Um, and that is an indirect attack, right, on the Texas DREAM Act. But the impacts are enormous, not only for the rights, um, the potential rights of undocumented students. This, of course, is going to put pressure, right, on, on schools um, and the legislature to repeal the act and to, you know, a, an immediate effect of potentially increasing tuition rates and fees and costs. Um, and on the schools themselves, right, and on all Texans. Um, at UNT, for example, the university um, has put evidence in the record showing that they're already looking at, uh, as a result of implementing the court's order, um, you know, $80 million, $100 million shortfalls of revenue for this year. You apply that to a school, for example, like the University of Texas at Austin that has a substantially higher um, out-of-state tuition um, population. Um, and you're talking about $150 million, you know, if not more. And so this is a real um, effort by YCT and TPPF to once again, note those parallels back to Plyler to exploit the fact that the state of Texas is not adequately funding our higher education system to achieve a policy goal that they have not been able to achieve in the legislature for 20 years since the Texas Dream Act was enacted. Um, they have filed bills and supported bills to repeal it. Um, and broad coalitions, bipartisan coalitions of Texans have just stood up and said, that's not right. That's not what we want in Texas. And so um, the litigation's ongoing and, and we'll be hearing um, that the Fifth Circuit will be hearing an appeal in that case, and IDRA is really proud to lead a coalition um, of, a, of amici to encourage the court to reverse that really harmful decision. Thank you so much, Paige. Um, it's such an important case. Um, as you as, as y'all know, another really important case that affects, you know, what what many people called the Plyler children, right? That that are are now. Um, you know, uh, adults is DACA. Um, you know, we are all um, waiting to see what the Fifth Circuit does. 
Um, we know that the dream uh, of those um, DACA recipients and, and of those um, Plyler children are really, really has remained unfulfilled, right? Because yes, um, you know, they have access now to in-state tuition and have, have DACA, but um, they're still living um, in, in, when it comes to DACA, court case to court case. You know, I, I had a, a client who, a former client when, when I was at Maldef, show me, um, you know, pictures of, of gobs of hair that she was losing, you know, just the, all the stress from not knowing um, the next step in, in, in her life. Um, and that's just uh, uh, incredible injustice when we think about um, the, inc the amazing contributions um, that our, our friends and family um, and, and neighbors uh, who have DACA um, have, have contributed, right, to, to our communities. Um, I mean, we're, we're talking about um, teachers and, and lawyers and um, literally hundreds of, of thousands of, of uh, what have been termed uh, essential uh, essential workers, you know, especially during during this pandemic, um, and so it, in addition to Governor Abbott's very uh, more uh, rhetorical attacks on Plyler, his his uh, very tangible attack on DACA um, is real. And so, just a quick background of the case: um, in May 2018, seven states led by Texas filed a lawsuit challenging DACA um, deferred action for childhood arrivals. Um, in a case called Texas versus the United States of America. Um, the case was filed nearly six years after um, DACA was put in place. Um, and since 2018, Maldef has been representing over a dozen brave DACA recipients that have been leading that fight against the, this multi-state challenge. Um, at, at the time, I remember, uh, I was actually directing policy and litigation for Maldef Southwest office. Our team led by um, the incredible vice president of, of litigation, Nina Perales of Maldef, um, she presented oral argument at a hearing um, on Texas's preliminary injunction motion. Um, you know, the, the, this was before the very conservative judge, um, Andrew Hainan, on behalf of the, the DACA recipients um, who had intervened in the case because they didn't uh, trust, uh, rightfully so, then the Trump administration to defend DACA. Um, and importantly, then at that time, the judge denied Texas's request for an injunction, uh, mainly because the states waited so long after DACA um, had begun in 2012 to actually file the case. Um, I just remember sitting at a, a Thai restaurant when, uh, with, with our legal team uh, when the judge refused to, to preliminarily halt the program as Texas had asked for. Um, and we just all screamed because we, you know, while that decision is obviously ongoing, it did not end things, it did stall the case, um, giving enough time for a new Congress, for a new president. And so it was an important um, victory in, in, in that case, even though it was just one piece. Um, so fast forward to last July, that very same judge in the case um, ruled that DACA was ultimately unlawful, um, but allowed DACA to continue um, for current recipients, um, so allowing for renewals, uh, but has banned the process of, of new applications. And so Maldif appealed that case to the Fifth Circuit. And so you saw, uh, you know, so many um, immigrants' rights advocates um, and, and activists, uh, activists come from across the country um, at the beginning of this month um, to the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans, uh, and they came to say, we're here to stay. Um, Gabby Pacheco, who is, is one of them, you know, talks about um, the, you know, the, their, their advocacy and, you know, she, I, I just want to, I, I know we're at time, so I, I just want to, to end with her words, right? Um, as we wait for the Fifth Circuit ruling in this case, um, such a critical case, um, you know, she, she said, uh, you know, the time is now, right? We, we, need, we need Congress to take action, right? We, we can't keep allowing our, our, our neighbors and families to live court case to case, court case. Um, the time is now, our home is here, um, and we're here. Um, and so I hope that um, as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of DACA and the 40th anniversary of Plyler v. Doe, um, we remember um, 
how hard fought the, these legislative and legal victories have been, and we stay vigilant um, and we continue in community um, to, to fight for the dignity uh, of our immigrant families. Uh, I want to take some time to um, answer any questions if there is time. Um, and just thank you so much, Sarah and Makri, for, uh, for having IDRA, Paige, and I here today. Um, and definitely invite you to celebrate with us next year uh, for our 50th anniversary, our, our Cincuenta Nera. Um, next year, 1973, we're founded and we'll be 50 next year. Well, I, I want to thank you for sharing this expertise with us. And, and there are a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned that Congress codified Plyler. Can, can you explain more about that? Um, yes, and, and Paige, feel free to step in too. Um, so Congress, uh, I, I'm not, I don't remember um, the, the year, but decided to actually make it a federal law, right? Um, and so uh, I know there are, there's been a lot of talk, especially with the Supreme Court lately, right? Um, about longstanding precedent, well-settled law, um, you know, being um, being under attack um, because it's only um, Supreme Court precedent as opposed to uh, actually in statute. And so in the case of Plyler, the, the, the Congress did um, essentially codify what the, the Supreme Court said in the case. Um, and so that as a, uh, it, it, it does, it's not a foolproof, right? But it does add a layer of, of protection um, that if in, in a potential challenge, uh, let's hope we never see one, but in a potential challenge, um, that would play uh, a, a big role. Right, and I would just add that in addition to the, the statute that Selena is referencing, the U.S. Department of Education has issued guidance affirming and instructing all schools that receive federal funding to comply with Plyler as well. And so there's another sort of layer um, there as well. Okay, okay. Um, it's an interesting arc between uh, Plyler as a five to four Supreme Court decision, so uh, decision that was not without controversy in 1982, but then fast forward to the Texas Dream Act um, 2001, which was not without controversy, but was supported by uh, Governor Rick Perry, uh, who felt that that was a very important move for the Texas economy. Um, and, um, and he did take some heat for it, but I think that from a university perspective, what has been heard is that it was mostly good for the universities. Um, and then of course, for the, all the folks who were able to get a, a college degree and you know, contribute to society in whatever ways. Um, so now that we see this, these current, um, like this lawsuit you were telling us about Paige challenging, um, what is what is the reasoning behind this back and forth or, you know, something that had been promoted as an economic um, benefit, the, the Texas Dream Act, an economic benefit for, for the whole state now being seen as unfair or bad policy? What's the switch? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, I think the the bottom line is, you know, Selena has described some of the, you know, the, frankly, the racist actions that um, this organization YCT has taken on, on Texas university campuses. You know, I was a student at UT Austin as well, a law student, you know, a couple of years after Selena, but, you know, even, you know, later when they had one of the affirmative action bake sales and staged a cash and illegal immigrant game. So this is not about, um, make no mistake, that the YCT lawsuit has nothing to do with higher education access or equity. Um, it's really about attacking the rights and the opportunities of undocumented students who have, um, just like the case was in Plyler, who have been contributing to the Texas economy, who um, have been going to Texas public schools, who intend more likely than not to remain in Texas and continue being contributing mem members of our society and our economy. Um, and so there's really no other way to explain it other than it's the exact same rationale that the proponents of the law at issue in um, Plyler did. And um, we are confident 
that, um, you know, broad coalitions of Texans, and, and hopefully that will be communicated to the courts and, you know, affirmed in subsequent legisl legislative sessions, right, that, that we really believe this is good for DREAMers and it's good for Texas. And I'm sorry, Sarah, it looks like my, my com um, computer cut in and out, but um, just to piggyback on what, what Paige was saying, I mean, you the, the DREAM Act, you had a situation, um, you know, session after session, right, when it was being attacked, we, you know, we were there um, as a broad coalition. You had AFL-CIO and the Texas Association of Business literally sitting side by side to defend and protect the Texas DREAM Act. And I don't think that, that has changed. I think that those same players um, from a broad coalition are still there and, and think that it is worthy of defense. I do think that we are seeing a different um, uh, political dynamic in the legislature and of course in the judiciary. And so uh, even more reason to remain um, extra vigilant. Wow, okay. Well, we've, we've had a lot to learn tonight about this court case and why it's still so important 40 years later. Uh, I, I don't see any more questions from the audience, but um, there are links in, to the uh, podcast, so you can learn more about Filer by listening to the podcast. You can subscribe to IDRA's newsletter. They always have lots of information about what's happening, uh, particularly around education and um, policy in the in Texas, but in the U.S., um, so always chock full of good information. And of course, we want to congratulate you, almost 50, um, and looking excellent. Uh, um, and what a wonderful uh, resource IDRA is for our community. So thank you so much. Um, I do want to invite everybody to join us again on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we'll be kicking off a new series of Maki Talks focused on Mexican-American civil rights sites. So we'll begin the series with an introduction to El Paso's Segundo Barrio neighborhood, which is now a National Historic Landmark District. Find out what that means and more on Wednesday, six o'clock, right here. And we hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. We do these on a regular basis, and so we hope we'll see you again. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.